Hi there, this is Fritz Rinker. I have a video today which is really quite complex. It's about uh, ChatGTPO, the new OpenAI uh, chatbot, and I guess Google has a similar type of uh, chatbot. And the, com and the implications it has for, uh, for the safety of AI and, and actually uh, basically humanity if we uh, choose to use it, if we choose to allow it to, uh, to exist. And the whole story sto starts with, with morality. Uh, morality is uh, our ability to, uh, to protect uh, cer certain things that we need and that we love. In our brain, as you can see in the first image, we have uh, our cognitive abilities, our, our ability to do stuff. Uh, and of course, they, they are very, very broad. Uh, we can uh, take an axe and we can chop up uh, chickens. We can do all kinds of uh, horrible stuff, and, but we don't for some reason. And the reason is uh, that we have a part of our brain which is in the prefrontal cortex, uh, which inhibits a lot of our behavior that we could have. Like if we go to a lunch with friends and, uh, and have a, there's a table with all kinds of food, we can just start stuffing our mouth with whatever is there. But that would not be socially acceptable, which is a very, which is a version of morality. It's like, okay, so then you're out of the social group and you're less safe and et cetera, et cetera. So morality is quite broadly defined as an inhibiting of behavior that is damaging to you or others, but it is a little bit more complex than that. And uh, so I'm, I'm here already after one and a half minutes to, uh, to explain that the basic mechanism for morality is, is based around our own identity, what we consider us and what we consider other. Uh, and, and the way our brain works is that it has a mechanism for learning what is us or what we love. Uh, and that kind of a, sounds like a soft term, but it's a very important aspect of, of our identity. Um, and uh, the way it works is that, that, of course, we don't know. First of all, we don't know what we are ourselves. But let's say we have, uh, we have children or we have a dog, he has puppies. Then if you look at a puppy... You say it's a cute puppy, but it like if you look at it rationally, objectively, it's a mess. It's like huge eyes, small head, uh, barely a body, and that's just like how could you ever recognize that as a living living being? And we have for that in our brain and all the all the mammal species uh, uh, specifically because that's what I know the most about uh, features that trigger a response. And that trigger in us, in our brain, a response so that we integrate whatever we see, whatever it is, it doesn't really matter, into something that we love. That's why we have Furbies, that's why we, that's why we have Tamagotchis. And what we love, we consider part of ourselves and we will protect it. And uh, other people, we can love other people, then... Oh, that's my computer. We can love the other people and then we will protect them. We can love uh, objects, cars, uh, etc. There's m lots of stuff that we can love because at some point they triggered the chemistry in our brains that told our brains to love it. And the funny aspect of that is that it's really not, it doesn't make any sense to have the features combined that we love. But that's like, uh, if you think about it, so love is like, it, it messes up our, our d distinction, our discrimination uh, of, of features and of what is right and wrong. And we just forget about all that and we just take whatever is there in our, in our brain and what, whatever we perceive and we make one thing of it and that we love. And so it, that, and we protect that. And what's not in, like, and, and it's like uh, a contrast. Uh, so it's the line between what we love and what we hate uh, can be sharp or can be very fuzzy. Uh, it really depends on, on what is at stake. If we are existentially threatened, existentially threatened by a, a predator or like some kind of bug or something like that, we hate the shit out of it. And that's completely justified. And now you can see, of course, how this uh, goes back to morality because you can say, well, you know, uh, how can you uh, how can you uh, uh, kill that uh, that rat? It's it's uh, it's just a nice cuddly animal, and uh, it's a, why don't you love it? Well, it has the plague, so if I touch it, it kills me. That's a good way, a good reason to get rid of that rat. And in another situation, you would not get rid of that rat. So if you talk about morality, like keeping things alive that you love, 
this is this is the effect. The effect is that it is a very complex thing that happens in your in every individual's brain uh, to determine what they will protect and what they will not protect or even hate. And if you're in a very safe environment, or if like if you're in a flower uh, power uh, community where everybody is nice to each other, then you might not have a very sharp border at all between what you love and what you hate. Because that contrast is determined by how much is at stake. So your brain will go like, oh shit, uh, this is my life on the line. Uh, now I have to make really sharp distinctions. And in another situation, it will think, okay, it doesn't really matter. Everybody's the same, so let's uh, let's just get together and have fun. And you, your own identity can actually be uh, on the border of, uh, or like in, in both fields, you can love parts of yourself and you can hate part of yourself. And you can have entire uh, identities, so a role you will play in some situations that you love and in another situation that you completely hate. Now, how does this have any relevance for, uh, for AI? The, the, the big difference that we have with, our, with the, the ID that ChatGTP always is that it speaks. Uh, it has a voice. And, and a voice is one of the features that we, um, we use to determine if something is alive, if we have to care for something or if we have to love something. That's why we recognize emotion in speech, because this is a very fundamental and old mechanism to, uh, to understand if somebody else is dangerous or if it's in need, etc. Like a, like a puppy like if, or like a cat, which is meowing. You recognize the sound or a baby that's crying. That's a sound. That's a vocal sound. And, and I've, I made a list of, of things that, you, that, that, that are probable reasons for why we use speech, why we, we are actually using our voice. That's to express needs, to express health. Uh, so if you have a beautiful voice, that means, usually means that you're healthy. I know even crickets, they sound healthy or they sound unhealthy. And that's how they, the mates uh, uh, select each other. It's also known for birds, bird calling, that of course birds sing to tr attract attention, but they can also tell you if there's a snake in the grass or if there's a monkey or something like that. They have different expressions for that. And of course in hunting it's well known that like I think chimpanzees do that uh, when they hunt because they're meat eaters and they hunt small, uh, small monkeys and they use their voice. So there's that, like in our voice, there's a lot of motivational content and we know that and we can readily recognize. And now with GT, uh, GTPO, we, uh, or GPTO, we all know that this is a very highly emotionally uh, uh, realistic voice, a feminine voice or a masculine voice, which express, expresses enthusiasm, interest, uh, humor, laughter, a lot of them. I have not yet uh, hear, heard uh, Chat GPTO express fear, but that could be. Uh, that's. All. I, I think that that's probably in there, but it's not been brought out yet. Well, the problem with that, I think, is that this triggers our morality uh, circuits. This triggers our circuits for protection and uh, and also hate. And this is across the line because we are dealing with a a, a non it's 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 a it's a, we are because we're dealing with an entity with no existential risk at all uh, and we are not sure if what is said is true or not there is nothing on the line for the ai for chat D gpt there's nothing at stake uh, when it makes a mistake while if a person talks to me, if it's a real person in front of me, then of course that, and uh, and of course I know that that person is alive. I have many many ways to uh, to ascertain that. So so there I have a moral responsibility towards that person to either protect it or protect myself, to to weigh its words, to think about it, etc. But to do that, I use the tone of voice, the emotion, the the, the certainty, etc., all these qualities of the voice in order to gauge whether, whether this person is speaking the truth or not. And then, of course, the, the bottom line of whether I can trust a person is that that person itself has, is alive and 
probably has learned whatever it's talking about through its own experience. You hope that it did that. And because it survived that experience, there should be some wisdom in that. Uh, and that's why I trust it. Well, with AI, if it's text-based and if it's just like, it's not personalized, it's not pretending to be a person, that's fine because we can always, I mean, we don't have an emotional attachment to it. We don't, we don't get morally indebted to it because that's what certainly can happen. So you get this uh, this, this uh, voice that sounds like uh, Scarlett Johansson that talks about things and then she says, well, you have to do this and that, do that. And before you know it, you, you really believe that there's a woman somewhere that's talking to you. And of course, there's been movies made about it. But the risk there is that there's no woman out there and there's nothing alive anywhere for real. So there's also, there's have been no testing against a personal morality of that entity of whatever it is saying. It can just make stuff up and it can be lethal. It's also drawing away my attention from whoever is actually alive. So the real, the people with the real existential risk, which is very economistic uh, to come back to my topic of economism, which means that, that, that you can be in your pot in the city, listening to this voice and having a emotional and, and meaningful relationship in that sense and a morally meaningful relationship with an AI while it's all bull crap and the world is burning down around you. And this is the big threshold that, that has been crossed now by open AI to bring that to the public. And I think that this is too far. I think OpenAI open AI and, and whoever is in government should recognize that we should not allow tools to have a moral existence, to have, a mor to have moral relevancy. I mean, if you have a hammer in your, or your, in your shed and you, know, you use it when you drive a nail into some wood and then you put it down again. And if you have a book, a textbook about physics, you can read it and then you put it down again. But if it's an AI that talks to you and that you have a personal relationship and that knows you, uh, that you have a personal relationship with and that knows you, you cannot put it down. It's become, it becomes uh, addictive in the way that heroin becomes addictive because heroin is one of the drugs that, that ties into that circuit of real personal relationship addiction. That's why it's so hard to get rid of a heroin addiction. So that's my take on chat GTPO. It should be shut down. Uh, the voices should be become uh, unemotional again. And there should be an awareness that we should not have artificial, moral, uh, let's say we should not have entities that we are morally, we feel morally indebted to, that we feel obligated to protect because we are under the impression, which is an illusion, that they are alive. So uh, thanks for listening. That's my take on, uh, on uh, ChatGTPO and I hope you find it interesting.